Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Treatment of Tobacco Dependence in the Healthcare Setting, Current Best Practices. I am Tracy McPherson. I will be your webinar facilitator today. I'm a senior research scientist in the Substance Abuse, Mental Health, and Criminal Justice Studies at NORC at the University of Chicago. If you have any questions or um, comments or interested in knowing more about uh, the work we're doing um, around screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, or any of the information we share with you today, I uh, provided my email here for you, esap1234 at gmail.com, or you can um, contact Misty Story, who will be, uh, has been in touch with you and will be in touch with you following the webinar. If you have any uh, needs or questions, concerns, uh, we are more than welcome to follow up with you and uh, see how we might be able to help you with what you're trying to do in your own organization around screening and brief intervention. And today's webinar is produced in partnership with the Brief Intervention Group, or the Big Initiative, NORC at the University of Chicago, the National Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment Addiction Technology Transfer Center, also known as the National Expert ATTC, and our partner NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals. Today's webinar is part of a series that we're offering uh, over the course of 2014. It's going to run from January to August. And as you can see, we've already offered a, about a half a dozen webinars on a variety of topics related to screening and brief intervention, including how it relates to ACA, or healthcare reform, how it's integrated into nursing settings, how SBI and SBIRT is integrated into criminal justice systems, and then topic-specific webinars around opioid risk, and we'll also be doing some upcoming ones around prescription medication abuse, depression, trauma, and other concerns. And most recently, uh, just last week, we uh, presented how to pitch SBIRT to payers. So for many of you out there who weren't able to join and are interested in knowing what are my talking points? What's the evidence? What are some case studies that I could use? There's a set of PowerPoints available to you. You are welcome to use as you try to pitch um, uh, doing screening brief intervention in your own organization and to your stakeholders. So please feel free to use those uh, PowerPoints and let us know how we might be able to help to get you additional information related to your specific setting to present a, a strong case for why uh, the organization should be integrating such services. Also coming up at the, towards the middle of the end of summer, we'll be having a two-part series related to integrated care, how training in integrated behavioral health uh, in the social work workforce, uh, that will be one topic, and why do integrated care at all? So we have also provided on our, our web, uh, website, hospitalexpert.web.com forward slash webinars, we have a downloadable flyer that you see to the left. You're welcome to distribute that freely, post it in your newsletters, uh, up on your bulletin boards. We really hope that you will uh, take advantage of the free quality education we're able to provide for you as a part of this webinar series. You can access materials to the webinar that we'll be presenting today, as well as all of the previous uh, webinars and all the upcoming webinars, all are housed in one place on our hospitalexpert.webs.com website. We have a webinars tab, which will allow you to access PowerPoint slides to, to today's presentation and all of the others we offer. There is access to the CE quiz there. And that's where all of the recordings, the archived on-demand um, sessions are posted. And those are posted fairly quickly. So all of them are up there except for today's, which will be posted within a few hours, assuming the recording goes as planned. And we also have offered uh, free CEs for almost all of our webinars, including the one today. So we'll be offering webinars um, for, for a variety of uh, professionals with who are looking for different types of credits. So we have approval from NADAC, from NASW, and from NBCC. It's also accredited by the American Probation and Parole Association and is accepted by OASIS. 
for 1.5 free CEs. And you'll take the online CE quiz, and you'll gain a free CE certificate as, uh, at the, at, once you've completed your, uh, your quiz. And today we'll have a question and answer session, which we will hold for the end of the session. We have a, a panel over on the right side of your screen that's going to allow you to ask questions through what we call the questions pane. You can put questions in there that are related to the content, questions you'd like to ask our presenter, as well as questions perhaps about technical issues. And the technical issues will be handled uh, by our technical facilitator. And there's our technical facilitator, Misty Story, who's the Director of Training and Professional Development at NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals. And she will be handling all the technical questions for you, and I'll be moderating the substantive uh, questions related to the content at the end. And this is our wonderful presenter today. I've been looking so forward to having Bruce Christensen with us. Uh, tobacco uh, screening and brief intervention and treatment is a, a really important topic, one that we have made some strides in, in, in working in this area through evidence-based practices and translating research into practice and using models out there that have shown to really be effective. And so Bruce is going to talk with us today and give us some background around uh, this issue, as well as talk to us about some of the models of, and that have been shown to be effective. And so this is a really important topic and one that I know so many people have been asking us to present more on. So we're really excited to have Bruce. He's a senior scientist in the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And he's been gracious enough to provide his email address should you want to follow up with him um, with something uh, specific that you might not have had a chance to uh, get your question answered or you had something a little more complicated that you couldn't ask to the question. He's been very kind to add his email here. So Dr. Bruce Christensen is a licensed psychologist, and he joined the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in 2006 where he is now as a senior scientist. He served as the project director for the 2008 update to the United States Public Health Service Clinical Practice Guideline Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence. He has assisted the Wisconsin Tobacco Prevention and Control Program within the Division of Public Health implement its strategic plan to address tobacco disparities since the plan was developed in 2002. For the past six years, he has served on the steering committee for the state's Wisconsin Nicotine Treatment Integr Integration Project, which he seeks to integrate the treatment of tobacco dependence into the Wisconsin mental health and substance abuse care delivery system. His current research projects address low-income smokers seeking services from the Salvation Army and smokers with significant and persistent mental illness receiving care from community support programs. Prior to joining the uh, University of Wisconsin CTRI, he worked as the Assistant Medical Director for Blue Cross Blue Shield United of Wisconsin and as a Managing Consultant at APS Healthcare. In this latter capacity, he directed a staff of analysts dedicated to advising the Wisconsin Medicaid program. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruce Christensen. Thank you, Tracy, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, NADAC and the other sponsor organizations for uh, allowing me to have some time with the audience today. Uh, we'll be talking about current best practices, the treatment of tobacco dependence in the healthcare setting. Uh, I'm going to attempt to the next hour or so to touch on seven topics. We we'll do a little bit of uh, background uh, where we are in, in the tobacco control movement and moving from that background uh, into uh, some models, the 5 A's model. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about medications, uh, focus on telephone quit lines, uh, talk about another model, the AAR model, uh, 
move on to a very emerging and important area, how to motivate those not motivated to quit smoking. And then I'll wrap things up with a disparity population uh, working with smokers who have a mental illness and or other addiction. So first, uh, setting the stage, just want to put a level playing field out there, uh, a common background understanding. So despite tremendous progress for the past 50 years, and as you know, this is the 50th anniversary of the original Surgeon General's report linking uh, smoking to uh, poor health com out outcomes, uh, we've made tremendous progress in those 50 years. We are now down to about 18% of adult Americans uh, smoking, uh, they're still smoking, and that is down from 42%. Uh, Despite that progress, it's still well recognized that smoking remains the largest source of preventable morbidity and mortality. Uh, and while we know smoking itself causes or contributes to many chronic diseases, it's really best to view smoking as an addiction and as a chronic disease itself. And importantly, uh, about 70% of smokers will express a desire to quit. That is, uh, quitting smoking uh, is a, a valued outcome for them. But at any one time, such as at a brief medical visit, uh, relatively few of them, 30% or less, uh, are willing to engage in an evidence-based method of quitting at that time. So there's this gap between uh, a long-term desire to quit uh, and the immediate intention to make a quit attempt, which is something that has to be addressed by the provider in that medical visit. And importantly, and one thing I'll focus a little bit on in my comments today, uh, smoking is now concentrated in specific populations that we have identified as tobacco disparity populations, and those populations bear a disproportionate burden from tobacco. There is not a, an official national federal list of such disparities. There is not even a consensus. But generally speaking, when you think of disparity populations, you can think of, of uh, uh, low income, low education, underemployed, unemployed, uh, people with mental illness or other substance abuse disorders, uh, Native Americans, other racial groups, uh, LGBT, uh, then very specific groups such as people uh, who already have comorbidities like HIV uh, or other spots of populations, for example, those that are incarcerated. And so increasingly we'll take a look at this a little bit, uh, that smoking now is concentrated in, in those populations. So the tobacco disparity story, and so I want to do want to talk a bit about that and, and digress a little bit, uh, as I think there's some important points to make. Uh, this is simply a graph, at least through June 4 or June of 04, of the great news about U.S. adult smoking prevalence. Uh, we start around the mid 60s because, again, that was the Surgeon General's report. That's where we kind of date the beginning of tobacco control policies. And when I talk about tobacco control policies, I'm linking all the national initiatives, raising taxes, clean air uh, acts, uh, restrictions to advertising and then promoting uh, evidence-based cessation, all of a package of tobacco control policies. So there you see uh, that we've gone down to, uh, as of June of 04, 20%. We are now down to about 18% adult prevalence. That has been a great public health victory. Uh, in fact, it's been uh, identified as the second greatest uh, public health uh, victory of the last century. In case you're curious, the greatest uh, public health victory of the last century um, was childhood immunization. So here's a picture of uh, children in elementary school lining up to get a polio vaccine. Uh, but I use this actually as a tobacco slide to illustrate how far we've come in our war on tobacco. Just in case you didn't quite notice it, and just in case that's not quite clear, you'll see the good doctor here is smoking. Uh, 
we've really have come a long way uh, through uh, increased taxes on the uh, federal and local level, local Clean Air Act, uh, advertising prohibitions, treatment modalities. We've summarized all that. We've really uh, denormalized smoking. And uh, people often don't remember uh, the uh, bad old days. But for example, uh, here's some classic ads. Um, here's pushing cigarettes as a way of forestalling aging and weight gain for women. Uh, Santa Claus was in the act pushing cigarettes as the right uh, Christmas gift, holiday gift. And of course, doctors would recommend camels. Uh, this one I like to use because this one really was, uh, shows you how far we've come, uh, blow on her face and she'll follow you anywhere. I don't think that's the case anymore. Oh, my mistake. This is not a classic vintage ad. This is a current ad for electronic cigarettes, but you'll see it's continuing the same themes as the classic ads from the big tobacco companies. Uh, smoke e-cigarettes and you'll be the leader of the pack. So within that great story, however, lies a, a, a finer analysis uh, that reveals a more complicated story. This is the same information, uh, the same span of 50 years, but now the prevalence of tobacco is broken down by education level. And if, for example, you look at the beginning of the tobacco story, the mid-60s, uh, you'll find that there was no relationship between education and smoking. That is, the group that smoked the least, which is in the graph here, the solid triangles, was college graduates. But the next least, right next to them, were the least educated, the open circles, less than a high school gra uh, graduate. If you then fast forward with your eye across 50 years and look what happens to the solid triangles, the college graduates, they have fallen precipitously. So now they're down to about, uh, oh, maybe 10% of people with college graduate uh, education smoke well below the average of the nation of 18%. By comparison, if you look at the open circles and follow that line across 50 years, they're virtually flat, that the, the smoking rate amongst people who don't have a high school education remains very highly elevated uh, almost uh, until very recently about 35%. So you'll see that over time, we've opened up these rather dramatic uh, disparity gaps and concentrations of smoking. So with that, I'm going to digress just a bit to get on my soapbox. Uh, and I'm doing this deliberately because I want to build a collective sense amongst the people listening today of responsibility to do more. And I'm going to do that by examining the origins of these disparities. Where did they come from? Certainly, uh, we know that uh, the tobacco industry is a villain in this story. Uh, they have certainly targeted certain populations. Here is a classic and iconic picture. These are the CEOs of all the big tobacco companies swearing in the Congress in a hearing uh, convened by Henry Waxman, who you may know is retiring this year. Uh, and here they're under oath, and they're all swearing that tobacco is not a addicting substance. Uh, for some reason, uh, none of them were actually held in contempt of Congress. Uh, the quote is uh, the uh, re reporting of what one of these executives said when asked, well, do you yourself use your product? Do you smoke? And his reply was, no, but we reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. But let's go back beyond the tobacco villain and look at this slide. This was, again, the opening up of disparities. Um, and you'll, what you should strike you, has always struck me, is that disparities didn't exist in 1965. They didn't exist uh, at the time we didn't have tobacco control, but as soon as we had tobacco control policy started, public health efforts to restrict advertising, raise taxes, etc., then we see the tobacco uh, gaps opening up. I think that begs the question, is this timing purely coincidence? And it's my hypothesis, my thesis today, that that is uh, indeed not a coincidence that tobacco disparities can be largely attributed to our own tobacco control policies. And thus, um, we have a collective uh, interest in doing more. 
And I would suggest that that's true on, on two levels, both a very general level and then a very specific level. For the general level, I would uh, mention an article that you, I would recommend everybody to get a chance to read. It came out in 2005 in American Psychologist, uh, The Rhetoric and Reality of Gap Closing, When the Have-Nots Gain, But the Haves Gain Even More. Uh, the first point, uh, the conclusion of this article after reviewing a lot of uh, public health and education programs like Head Start, for example, and they note that when those programs are widely made available uh, that are designed to, for maximum improvement of population, inherently and inevitably, you get disparities. Uh, the best example they have is Head Start. Uh, again, Head Start was originally designed for people who were not uh, adequately prepared to start school. Uh, as time went on, the eligibility uh, requirements were loosened and more people were enabled to get into Head Start. And they found that uh, relatively those that had a better beginning, uh, even prior to Head Start, gained even more than those have-nots that were least prepared. So the point being, the conclusion is if you have a widely available public health program uh, that's meant to address uh, issue on a national level, you will create disparities. Um, the next two points they've concluded, which I think uh, I will just mention in passing, uh, if your response to that is to divert resources to address the gap, uh, and you have finite resources, and certainly we do have finite resources, uh, you won't make as much overall progress. So it's kind of a, a trade-off. And this trade-off, they conclude, uh, about population progress versus closing gaps, is, really, is not a question for science. It's a question of cultural values and priorities. And of course here I'm really saying in another uh, phrase, nothing other than low, the low-hanging fruit phenomena. That is, it's always the case that the low-hanging fruit, that is the haves, gain more than the have-nots. And because of that, we have plenty of evidence uh, that this gap, uh, these various gaps are growing. Uh, this is the mental health gap. This is uh, New York data based on the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Uh, they looked at people who responded to the BRFIS in 2000, 2001, and 2008, 2009, uh, and then broke that down by those that had good mental health and those that had poor mental health. And of course, you see the gap. But in, importantly, I want to point out that the gap is getting bigger. In 2001, there was a 12% gap, and by the time 2008-2009 rolled around, that gap was, is now at 16.8%. And that is uh, reflective of the article because uh, you could argue that the have-nots, those that don't have good mental health, uh, benefited a little bit, but the haves benefited more. That is, low-hanging fruit uh, responded, uh, leaving behind populations. As another example, uh, national data, the National Health Interview Survey, again tracking between 1997 and 2011, those without serious psychological disorder and those with serious psychological disorder. And you'll see the have-nots uh, um, did improve a bit, but the haves improved much more. So now the gap has gone from 19.5% to 23.9%. So that's um, kind of the analysis of the general level. It's, it's simply a, a reflection of what happens when we have uh, widely distributed public health programs. Uh, unless you're very mindful otherwise, uh, we will get gaps. There's also, uh, on a specific level, I want to point out some examples of our tobacco control policies having unintended consequences. And again, uh, policies being collectively tax policy, uh, clean air policies, advertising restriction policies, and treatment policies. So for example, uh, one policy, and a great one that it is, uh, we have tobacco advertising restrictions and, and many mediums like print, billboards, movies, etc., magazines, but we do permit point-of-sale advertising so that you can see in your local convenience store all kinds of ads for the various tobacco products. Well, what's the consequences of that? One consequence is that our policies 
uh, although uh, are across the board and population wide, they tend to fall on particular populations. Um, so for example, if you look at uh, uh, how many outlets there are of, for retailer density, and this is uh, Erie, New York, but there's been done on other places as well, uh, you'll find that uh, zip codes or areas that have a high preponderance of African Americans or high uh, dominance of poor uh, residents have much more um, exposure to point of sale advertising, which means simply those little urban kids walking to school are passing a whole lot of mom pop corner stores full of ads for tobacco. So unintended consequence of restrictions of advertising has been that we now have differential exposure to advertising. Uh, another ex a quick example, um, we know one thing that happens when uh, we increase taxes is that smokers will, uh, some will respond by quitting and that's a great health effect of increasing taxes. It's a very effective way to, to uh, increase those that are quitting smoking. Uh, but other smokers do cost minimization strategies. Uh, they will roll their own. Uh, they will buy uh, lower cost cigarettes. They may buy off the inter internet. Uh, and some of those minimization strategies are not as available to uh, those living in poverty. A good example is uh, in some uh, states, one can drive out to the nearest Indian uh, reservation and buy uh, cheaper cigarettes. But one wouldn't, one to do that, one would need a car, and one isn't going to do that to buy a pack. You're going to take enough money with you to buy two or three or four or six cartons. Well, it turns out, as you realize, people who have limited incomes may not have transportation, and they may not have the disposable income uh, to buy in multiple cartons. Uh, as a one last quick example, uh, we often tell smokers, you know, uh, the uh, over-the-counter medications uh, like the patch, the gum, uh, are really priced to be about equivalent to smoking. So if you're going to spend the money for smoking, why don't you spend the money for a medication? Uh, you, it won't set you back anymore and you'll have the great advantage of quitting smoking. That's not entirely true because of the way they're packaged. That is, uh, although on a day-to-day -day basis they cost about the same, uh, maybe even less for NRT, uh, but due to the packaging, uh, the medications packaged a month at a time costing 40 to $60, while you can buy a pack of cigarettes for $8. And again, if you're poor without a lot of income, it's perfectly honest to say uh, somebody who's in poverty to say cigarettes actually are, don't cost me as much when they mean by that I can afford to buy a, a pack of cigarettes, even buy a single cigarette although that's illegal, and I can't afford to lay out that much money for a whole month of NRT. So another unintended consequence of our tobacco control policies. So that's the end of my soapbox for the afternoon. Uh, I do hope I've uh, made a case that we have a particular uh, responsibility uh, to address tobacco disparities. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. Talk about uh, the five A's models. And fortunately, uh, the treatment for tobacco in the medical setting is not as uh, grand as, say, uh, the Parthenon. It's really more like the humble stool. Uh, it's a three-legged stool. We need three things uh, to address tobacco. We need to provide and encourage our uh, smoker uh, patients to use medication. We need to provide counseling or coaching and we need to provide support. If we can mobilize those three things, we will increase the odds that somebody will quit smoking about eightfold over simply quitting on their own without help using only willpower. I'm not going to say uh, much about support, so this is my reminder uh, to say support is important. Don't mind Frank, he's just been a little needy since he quit smoking. Uh, support is absolutely critical uh, to the quitting process. Much of what I'm going to say uh, is drawn from uh, the series of uh, treating tobacco use independence put out by the Public Health Service. Uh, first one came out in 96. It was revised in 2000. 
and the most updated one uh, update came out in 2008. Uh, cumulatively, that summarizes 8,700 uh, research articles, and it, at this point, current up through 2007. Here is a typical uh, evidence table that one will find in the uh, guideline, and it uh, sets the stage for my uh, exploring the five A's. This is simply a, a, a meta-analysis, that is analysis of many studies, in this case 43 different studies, that looked at how intense does the coaching or counseling about tobacco have to be to be effective. And in this analysis, uh, no contact was set as the baseline effectiveness uh, effect size of one. And we found through all those studies that absolutely minimal counseling, here's defined as less than three minutes, was uh, significantly more effective. Uh, effect size 1.3 can be interpreted to say that minimal counseling is 30% more effective, 30% better outcome than no contact. And even fairly minimal counseling, three to 10 minutes, was 60% more effective. Now, on the uh, one hand, uh, I know time is very precious in the medical visit. Uh, and so I understand that it's not trivial to say, spend 10 minutes on tobacco. On the other hand, this is a nasty chronic disease, a nasty addiction. And to realize that one could spend as little as three to 10 minutes and get a 60% proven outcome is quite remarkable. And uh, then the question becomes, well, how does one use those three to, to 10 minutes? And that gives us the five A's um, that's put, been uh, put forward by the guideline. Uh, the first A is ask. Uh, ask about tobacco use for every patient at every visit. Identify and document tobacco use status as a vital sign. and then advise the patient about their tobacco use for those that use tobacco. So you advise to quit. In a clear, strong, and personalized manner, urge every tobacco user to quit. And if you can personalize that or tailor that because of your knowledge of the patient, then by all means do that. So you can say, you know, Bill, I know uh, you, you are concerned about your diabetes. Did you know that smoking will really complicate your diabetes? or I know you've lost uh, your father to uh, COPD, uh, you do understand that tobacco plays a large role in that. I know you have concerns about that. I need to advise you that that's the best thing you could do to improve your, your health. Uh, and then you assess the willingness to make a quit attempt. Uh, so are you willing to try to quit at this time? I can help you. If they say yes, then you go to the meat of the five A's, uh, the assist. You assist them in their quit attempt. Uh, and that means, again, think of three-legged stool. For the patient who wants to make a quit attempt, that means using coaching, uh, medicines, uh, and support to help them quit. Uh, specifically, um, uh, we know people do better if they have a plan and prepare. So that can include things like, well, what's your date, quit date going to be? Uh, how are you going to prepare for that? Uh, what are you going to do when you have high-risk situations? How are you going to get yourself through an urge or a craving? And that's part of providing practical counseling or, or coaching. Um, and by the way, we tend to use coaching and talking to men because sometimes uh, men uh, are, uh, shy away a bit from counseling. Uh, this is not uh, sit on the couch. It is basically developing a fairly uh, short range skills that are that will make the quit attempt go better, and of course provide social support. If you want, you can think of terms of uh, the stars schema. Uh, you so we want to set a quit date, ideally within two to three weeks. There seems to be some merit in striking with irons is hot. So if somebody uh, would uh, like to quit. You don't want to wait too long. You probably want to move them along with a fairly soon quit date. You want to have them tell others uh, that they're going to quit and ask for support. Uh, ask others not to smoke around them. 
Uh, and, and some patients can be reluctant to do that because they may well tell you, well, I've done that before, but obviously I'm smoking again, I've relapsed, uh, I'm reluctant, uh, I want to keep it quiet and to myself. To the degree possible, I would encourage them nonetheless to go public because uh, there are times that the support person can be incredibly helpful. Uh, the A is anticipate and plan for challenges and temptations. Uh, so the more predictability we can get, the better. Uh, there's a pretty standard list of likely challenges that you can present to the patient and they can talk about their particular ones. Uh, but for example, people smoke when the unexpected stress comes along. Uh, alcohol is a, a, a great uh, cohabitor of smoking. Other smokers, seeing other smokers, smelling smoke, uh, concerns about weight gain, etc. And then for each of these, develop a coping plan. Uh, what are you going to do when X, Y, or Z happens? And it's perfectly legitimate uh, if there are some really difficult challenges to encourage the patient simply to avoid those situations until they get some confidence under their belt. So, for example, if somebody is a social smoker and very much smokes uh, at the, in the bars, then simply say, could you for the next two weeks not go to bars, uh, eliminate that from your lifestyle. We're going to address that when you're confident you've got you know, 10 days, two weeks of uh, not smoking under your belt. Very important, have them remove all tobacco products uh, from their home, their car, their work environments, tobacco, ashtrays, uh, matches, uh, any reminders, uh, etc. Um, if it's difficult to get a cigarette, then when they uh, do feel close to smoking, they may not. Uh, there was a great study done in Texas where they simply looked at, regardless of the treatment they were giving, people who lived closest to a tobacco vendor were more likely to fail, more likely to relapse. Uh, their explanation was when a person uh, wanted to, uh, uh, felt close to smoking and tobacco was nearby, that made it more likely. If you had to drive a long way to get a cigarette, uh, that gave the person time to recover from their urge, get on top of whatever that was their feeling, and decide to turn the car around. And it's often uh, important to urge total abstinence, uh, go uh, and stick to that, even if a person slips uh, or laps. And then if they do slip or lapse, you change mode to say, lapses are common, let's work not to make that lapse a relapse. Rather, let's, what can we learn about that situation got you to smoke so we can move on and do better next time. The final A is to arrange, uh, and that, of course, refers to do the follow-up, schedule a uh, contact with them, it, uh, busy practices. It can be in, done by telephone or email, uh, but preferably you know, the first week after the quit date or even better yet, on the quit date. So these are the five A's, ask about tobacco, advise to quit, assess willingness to quit, assist in that quit attempt, and arrange follow-up. Uh, this is my reminder. Uh, I just thought I'd drop by and personally congratulate you on your accomplishment. No one has ever quit smoking 17,000 times in one year before. Even if one does the five A's, uh, your patients who smoke will not quit in droves. Uh, it is a, a chronic disease. It is a nasty, nasty addiction. Uh, and if you're going to spend 10 minutes with patients, yes, some will quit, uh, but the vast majority will not. Uh, and so you as a provider need to understand that you're on a fairly lean schedule of reinforcement that is reward uh, of seeing your patients quit smoking. Uh, uh, but over time, if you persist, you're planting seeds, uh, and the five A's do increase the odds that somebody will quit. Uh, a note on medications. Medications are really important, uh, particularly in combination with counseling and coaching. Uh, the next are two evidence tables from the last guideline. Again, if you look at how the effect of medication alone, that is simply providing uh, a patch, the gum, whatever, without any coaching, and then you add counseling to that very same medication, the effectiveness increases 40%.
looked at the other direction. If you do provide counseling alone and then add medication to that counseling, whatever form that counseling may be, brief or long, uh, you increase the odds of smoking uh, quitting by 70%. So medications and medicines uh, are really important. Uh, to the degree that the patient will tolerate medicines and as much counseling as possible is what you want to shoot for. There are now seven first-line medications shown to be effective and FDA approved. Uh, bupropion, uh, uh, known as Zyban, or, and as you probably may know, it's an antidepressant known as Wellbutin. Uh, this was discovered anecdotally by a psychiatrist in California who just took note that his patients who were on this antidepressant uh, reported smoking sensation that was quite easy. Then we have five versions of nicotine replacement treatment, the gum, the inhaler, the lozenge, the spray, the patch. Uh, some of these are prescription only. Some are both prescription and over-the-counter, and some, I believe, the lozenge is only over-the-counter. Um, and then you have Rinoclin um, or Shantex. All these work along the same, for the most part, the same lines. Uh, the way you can uh, talk to your patients about conceptualizing the value of medicines is that they allow the physical addiction to continue at some level while the patient begins to break the learning bonds that maintain smoking. That is all those uh, associations they've learned over many, many, many learning trials of smoking. That is, boy, when I drink coffee, a cigarette would taste so good, or I smoke when I drive, or I smoke when I drink, or I smoke um, uh, when I get upset, when things uh, disappoint me. Uh, you can have that person begin to get through all those situations without cigarettes, even while they have some nicotine in their system. It allows those two processes of addiction to be separated a bit. The other thing inside about medications is that uh, uh, although they will all make quitting easier, they don't make them easy. And that's a guard against uh, the patient uh, who expects to take a pill and uh, they'll be easy, and of course when it isn't, then they relapse. New about medications, uh, we now routinely use combination of medications. Here's a recommendation, uh, strength of evidence A, from the guideline. Uh, certain medications, uh, first, certain combinations first-line medications have been proven effective, so they should be used whenever possible. In particular, using a patch and some other uh, uh, NRT that's ad libum like a gum or a spray. Uh, the rationale there is the patch gives kind of a steady state of nicotine, and then the patient can either add gum or the, uh, or the lozenge uh, when they get into a rough spot or they can anticipate that they're going to be tempted to smoke. And importantly, the most effective single agent for smoking sensation is clearly varenicline, but the effectiveness of combining a constant source of medicinal nicotine like a patch with the gum or the lodging equals and actually may exceed that of renoclin. So I've had patients who have heard uh, that Shantex uh, has some undesirable side effects, prefer not to use Shantex. Uh, you can certainly in good faith say, let's combine uh, a patch with another uh, oral NRT. We now use medications routinely long term, up to easily through a year. Uh, most were originally approved for eight weeks. We also uh, use them uh, pre-quit. Um, and I want to note here that um, historically all these three types of uses would be off-label use and not on the label of the NRT products, which historically have said, um, you know, that if you if you, uh, you can't combine medications, you can't use them more than eight weeks, and if you're smoking, by all means, do not use them. That changed as of a year ago. Um, last March, the FDA uh, recommended to the product manufacturers that could now take that warning off of their labels. I don't know if it's been in instituted yet. I haven't read a label recently, 
but uh, they now can eliminate the warning and, and state that there are no significant safety concerns if you're using uh, over-the-counter NRT uh, with another NRT or including a cigarette. Uh, this had to, actually had a, a very much a liberating effect. One of the problems was uh, in the old label, if a patient was trying to quit using, say, the patch, and then was slipping, having relapses, and smoking, uh, the prudent thing would have been said, well, then take the patch off because you can't smoke and use the patch. And of course, clinically speaking, that's the opposite of what you want to do. You really want to say to that person, well, obviously, by virtue that you're slipping, you're struggling with this, let me give you two patches, or let me give you a gum to add to the patch. Uh, that's not the time to withdraw the medicine, that's the time to increase the medicine, and now we can do that uh, and not uh, be off-label use. Uh, telephone quit lines. Uh, I do want to make sure you're all fully familiar with these. Uh, this is uh, what the guideline said about telephone quit lines compared to uh, minimal or no counseling or simply self-help that is giving people literature about smoking. In quit lines and, and the analysis of the, of the guideline was 60% more effective than self-help material. So much so that the guideline has made 10 overall recommendations. And number eight on that list of Big Ten was the following, telephone quit line counseling is effective with diverse populations and has broad reach. That's a good way of getting a lot of people involved in smoking sensation. Therefore, clinicians and healthcare delivery systems should both ensure patient access to quit lines and promote quit line use. There is one general number throughout the country that works. Uh, what happens is that if uh, most states have, well, states have individual quit lines, calling that number will route the per caller automatically to their uh, applicable state quit line. Uh, they provide coaching uh, and counseling. Some uh, uh, will provide medication. This fluctuates uh, with uh, state budgets. Uh, quit lines are funded typically by states as does the amount of coaching or counseling. So there's no generic thing I can tell you about the medication. It varies by state by state. For example, currently in, in my state of Wisconsin, uh, our quit line can provide two weeks starter medication of the over-the-counter medications. Depending on the quit line and the quit line vendor and what the state's paying for, they provide, besides coaching and medication, uh, might well send a work, work home to the address of the caller. Uh, they even will provide materials for the support people to say, if you want to support this person quitting, here are some do's and some don'ts. Uh, they may well have an online presence, so a person can do a quit, quit plan formation online, uh, ask the expert online, uh, talk, do on a chat room with other smokers uh, struggling with quitting. Uh, and a quit line may give information on local programs. They may well say, well, based on your address, you know, there's an NA program uh, three blocks away, and here's their hours. There are typically multiple ways to access. Certainly you can call. I mentioned you can often get online and enroll. One thing that's fairly common now is we call facts to quit. What would typically happen in a medical setting is that the, uh, the doctor provider would give the smoker a card with a quit line number and say, please call. And what would happen, of course, in many cases, would be nothing. Uh, that is, the patient who may be acquiesced and said, yes, I'll call, somehow never gets around to it. So most states and most quit lines develop a facts to quit uh, process where a person would agree, said, yes, I will receive a call. They fill out basically an informed consent form that gets faxed to the applicable quit line, and the quit line doesn't wait to hear the person from the person. Uh, they call out to that person to get them enrolled. And that form includes when's the best time to call the quit line. Uh, we are beginning to see electronic transfer. Uh, that is really harnessing the electronic health record. Uh, for example, we just finished a project at our center with one of the big uh, uh, EHR vendors, Epic, and one of our local health systems, uh, Dean Health System, and we piloted a program where uh, the health record would send it right to the quit line, and in turn, the quit line 
working with that patient, what was prescribed, what medication, what were the counseling sessions, how many counseling sessions, was automatically re-entered back into the health record, uh, which makes it absolutely seamless uh, and of great value to the uh, healthcare setting. I think as time goes on, we'll be seeing uh, more and more of that. The uh, availability of Quitline leads us to the viability of the next model, which is the AAR model. We need to realize that doing the 5A isn't necessarily the responsibility solely of the primary health care practitioner. Um, the ask, for example, is routinely done by, by a rumor who is using the electronic health system to notify the doctor, yes, the patient you see next is a smoker. Uh, and some of the follow-up need not be done by the, the physician. Uh, and the availability of a quit line as part of that team makes this model very viable. It is the ask, advise, and refer model. That is, ask every patient if they're a tobacco user, uh, advise them uh, that uh, quitting is the most important thing they could do for their health, and then uh, refer them uh, and refer often to the quit line. Uh, there are ways you can improve that referral. Uh, essentially, you'd like to arrive at a sense that the provider in the quit line at least in the eyes of the smoker, is a partnership that they're working in together. Uh, and to do that, there are certain things to consider, one of which is you do want to be mindful of how you prepare that smoker for what to expect when they call the quit line. Uh, feedback we have from quit lines is, you know, people call them, they don't know what this is all about, they don't know what to expect, uh, they don't know how long the call may take, and for those various reasons, the call does not go well, and rather than be a, a, a positive experience, turns into a negative experience for the smoker. Likewise, if the provider can ascertain from the quit line, for example, when the quit date is, then not only will the quit line call the patient on that date, but the provider office, either by email or texting or even a call, can also reach out, and thereby giving this perception to the patient that my provider and quit line are our team, all of us working together to help me quit. Uh, another thought uh, to do that is to work with the state vendors for quit lines and to make sure the counselors know who the provider is. It's usually in their database but may not be on their particular screens at the time they call the patient so that the counselor, the coach, can refer to the doctor by name. Oh, I know you're working with Dr. Jones at this location. You know, uh, we work with some of his patients. Uh, I'm here to help you. We developed a video, uh, it's about three minute, two and a half, three minute video, uh, to it demonstrate what things you want to touch base on when you prepare somebody to call the quit line. Um, the uh, technology day won't support showing it, nor do we have the time, but here's a location where you can download it and take a look at it. You're free to use this video if you want, uh, but more importantly, we did it for a generic example of a video uh, that you might want to prepare your own physician to do uh, and to model after. Before leaving the AAR model, I do want to caution you that you want the AAR model not to be the ARF model, uh, which is ask, advise, refer, and forget. That is, you still have the fifth A, the follow-up, and again, if one uh, works with a quit line, if that's your primary source of coaching, uh, to erect this sense of partnership, uh, that may go a long way so that you don't forget about the patient as well. So let's talk about how to motivate the unmotivated. As I mentioned at the onset, although the vast majority of smokers want to quit, uh, the distinct minority will agree to do so when you uh, ask them, uh, do the assessment, do you want to quit? So it often depends, I ask the question, if you say, do you want to quit someday? Again, a great number of people say yes. If you say, well, let's set a quit date, you'd be surprised how many people have reasons not to do that. So are you done? Is that all you can do? Uh, from the guideline, the recommendation now is that motivational intervention techniques do work, and therefore clinicians should use these techniques to encourage smokers who are not willing to quit to consider making a quit attempt. So by contrast, here are the five A's as they existed in 2000, ask, advise, assess, 
assist and arrange. They changed in 2008. I bold to hear the difference. So in the assist, we also now say for patients unwilling to quit at the time, provide interventions designed to increase future quit attempts. So what would happen traditionally is a smoker would come in, the nice the provider would ask if you use tobacco. If yes, they would advise that you should quit. And then they would assess willingness to quit. Do you want to quit now? And when the smoker said no, that was the end. There's nothing else for the provider to do. Now we're saying, now we've, we've increased, we've raised the bar, but now you go to plan B, and your mission is to assist not in quitting, but assist in motivating to quit. So here's kind of that kind of flow sheet. Uh, on the far left is the typical scenario where I ask if you smoke, advise to quit, assess, are you willing to quit? If yes, help the quit attempt. And now we say if the assessment says, no, I don't want to quit, then you provide an assist to motivate a quit attempt. The right side, by the way, just uh, uh, footnotes that if a person is a non-tobacco user, you still have to, you should ask if they are a recent non-tobacco user, if they're struggling with relapse, and if so, there's still some service to provide uh, them for that. And lo and behold, it's the same three-legged stool to assist the um, unmotivated, that is, com combining support, counseling, and yes, medicines. And I'm going to present uh, three different uh, structures to provide, out of which we can provide uh, motivation to those uh, unmotivated to quit. The first of the guideline mentions the five R's. Talk with the smoker, ask the smoker to indicate why quitting is personally relevant to them. Uh, ask the person to uh, at, talk about potential negative consequences for continued smoking. So what are the risks of continued smoking to increase the valiance of that? Uh, ask the smoker about the potential benefits of quitting. Uh, help the patient anticipate roadblocks, so what bears might be, what are the challenges. Uh, repeat that every visit. Uh, and that's the five R's. A different approach uh, is uh, taken from motivational interviewing, and obviously uh, we're not uh, going to this in any detail. It takes a, a fair amount of work to become uh, expert at motivational interviewing. Uh, for those familiar with MI, uh, this is based on concepts like make sure we meet the patient where they're at, uh, always expressing empathy, open-ended questioning. I want to develop discrepancy in the smoker's mind between what they're doing, which is the behavior of smoking, and where they want to be someday, their long-term goals, which is a non-smoker. Uh, patients will resist, so I have to roll with that, uh, keep hanging in there with them. I want to support their self-efficacy, their confidence, because we know self-efficacy is one of the best predictors of successful quitting. And as they start talking about, well, maybe I could cut down, I really want to reward that change talk. Now the motivation interviewing and the five R's, although they share some things in common, uh, there are some differences that I would like to uh, point out. The five R's really are weighted toward making a quit attempt. You know, the, the benefits from quitting, uh, the risk for continued smoking. It might take, it starts a different point. Uh, it's basically saying, look at these are people that are not motivated to quit smoking. Uh, that, uh, although they would like to someday, that suggests an ambivalence. Uh, they're stuck in an approach avoidance conflict, if you will. They'd like to, but they're not making steps toward doing that. Uh, it makes sense that I want to start where the patient's at. So I will want to talk with them not only about their thoughts about the benefits of quitting, but also uh, talk about uh, where they're at, which is what are the good reasons you have to smoke? Uh, and that may sound counterintuitive, and you wouldn't want to do that if somebody's already motivated to quit. You want to move right to helping them make a quit attempt and a quit plan. But if somebody isn't there yet, it makes perfect sense to say, uh, it's somewhat counterintuitive to say, well, let's talk about all the things that you like about smoking because they're there. So one way that you can do that is what's called the decisional balance worksheet. Basically, uh, help the person walk through four questions. Tell me all the good things about continuing to smoke. Uh, 
I like it. It tastes good. Um, um, if I, uh, etc. Tell me about the bad things about continuing to smoke. Well, I'm, I have a risk for heart disease. Um, I, I will be a bad example to my children. Tell me all the good things about quitting. Well, I won't smell anymore. I'll live longer. And tell me all about the bad things about quitting. Well, I know from experience, I get emotionally distraught when I quit. I get headaches. I don't sleep. Uh, I'm ornery. Uh, I'm not fun to be around. So you get on the table all the pluses and minuses, uh, and then that is where you would start. Uh, and then what I do, and I now deviate from MI, but if I'm working in a Salvation Army setting, for example, and have just a limited amount of time, I will be fairly structured, and I will direct the person who did the balance worksheet to say, well, now go back through those lists of pros and cons, and tell me about what are the most important ones to you. And I'm deliberately trading off here the concept of important versus the immediate uncertainty. Because for most people, the important things will be uh, favoring quitting. Like, well, I certainly would like to live as long. I really don't want to die from disabling disease. I really don't want to be a bad role model for my children. Uh, I'd like to be alive to see them walk down the, uh, you know, the, the, in the wedding. Um, and it turns out what maintains behavior isn't those long-term uh, outcomes, but the immediate outcomes of smoking. When I smoke, withdrawal goes away. When I smoke, I, I feel I can relax. When I smoke, I enjoy it. So if we can focus the um, uh, person's attention on the longer term, that's a good structured way of, of encouraging that discrepancy of what they're doing and where they want to be. So it's often a very good way of, of hooking them. Uh, I have here another video that you can watch. It's our role play of motivating a quit attempt using the decisional balance worksheet and it takes about five minutes. Uh, another way of motivating the unmotivated uh, is behavioral counseling. Um, you can have practice quit attempts. Uh, again, you want to approach the smoker where they're at to say, you know, I'm not going to ask you to quit. I heard what you said. You want to quit someday, but not now. Are you willing to talk to me about getting ready to quit, learning what you need to learn so that when the time comes, when it's right, you'll do well? One thing we can do is simply have you practice for 24 hours, not a permanent quit attempt, uh, just just to go 24 hours, or are you willing to cut down? If you're smoking a pack a, a day, how about trying going down to eight cigarettes or six cigarettes? Or maybe give up that toughest cigarette, maybe that first cigarette in the morning, delay that for another 20 minutes. Or how about giving up uh, smoking and coffee or smoking and driving while you're maintaining smoking all other places? And, and you can compensate and smoke more if you want elsewhere just to begin to cut down. It turns out there's evidence that those uh, strategies uh, will lead to more quit attempts. Although we know they work, we don't know why they work. Uh, there are some hypotheses, one of which may be that these techniques increase self-efficacy. And we know that, again, that's a good predictor of successful quitting. That is, somebody can go a day, they may come in and say, you know, it wasn't as bad as I thought. I could maybe go two days. Um, second thing they may work is you are beginning to break the bonds that maintain smoking so that you begin to weaken the bond between coffee and smoking, early morning smoking, driving and smoking, stress and smoking. The other thing uh, perspective people have suggested is why these work is to realize that, that the coaching really addresses a certain set of skills. Um, you know, how to delay an urge, how to get through an urge, how to uh, uh, tobacco-proof my house. And, and, and so there has to be a mindfulness about skill acquisition. And we need to ask the question, what's the optimal conditions to learn a new skill and to practice a new skill? Well, it turns out people uh, learn new skills best when they're not under a great deal of pressure. The example I always use is, you know, you wouldn't jump on an airplane with uh, a novice a parachuter say, on the way down, we're going to teach you how to pull your ripcord. 
the anxiety and the panic is so great, you wouldn't want to count on that as a time to learn something new. Well, it turns out that do we really want to have our smokers practice all these new skills when they're facing uh, the big quit date? That is, I got to stop and never smoke ever again. That's uh, stressful. Uh, it also is a time of withdrawal and the body's doing flip-flops. Uh, why not? It makes more sense to practice these behavioral skills when there isn't the pressure of a quit attempt. That is, we're just practicing here. And you have medications, and uh, it is now uh, evidence in the 2008 guideline that e at, even if you recruit people who are not willing to quit, but at least willing to talk about their smoking and maybe cut down, and if you give them medicine versus placebo, you get two and a half more times effectiveness. Now, notice that the absence rate goes from like 4%, which is what you'd expect out of uh, a willpower attempt, up to a very modest 8.4, which is still two and a half times greater. Uh, but again, bear in mind that these are people that did not want to quit, and because we give them uh, uh, medications to try out, they go on and make a quit attempt and successfully quit. I've now I've come across one study recently using Vreniclin, uh, and they recruited people in this study that were unwilling or unable to quit completely but would like to within 12 weeks. They kept on medication for 24 weeks, and they found that even amongst this group of unmotivated people, 32% uh, who had uh, Vreniclin versus 6.9% who had a placebo uh, actually successfully quit smoking. I have not seen that in print yet in a peer-reviewed journal, and just note it is sponsored by Pfizer. So hopefully it will come out in print soon. So let's talk about working with smokers who have a mental illness and other addiction, our last topic for the day. Prevalence is very high. Um, here's a table from a number of sources as high in some samples, 80% or more. Uh, with some of the thought disorders. Uh, just a note that uh, these disparate populations are not um, separate, that, there's, that they coexist and co-mingle. This graph simply shows the relationship between education and mental illness. That is, again, as you go down the cigarettes, uh, smoking decreases, its education increases, and also within each educational level, those who have a mental illness smoke far more than those who do not. So working with smokers, three things to suggest you do. The first is introspect about whether you have any biases. Uh, there are certain myths, uh, and these are myths. Uh, things we've heard from providers, uh, people with mental illness, and literature documents, beliefs that my patients don't want to quit, my patients can't quit. Trying to quit will harm my patient, will undo the progress we made, it will destabilize the patient, it will lead them to relapse on their other substance of abuse, alcoholism, heroin. Uh, now is not the time, we'll do it later when there's more stability, less stress, and even smoking is one of the few pleasures my patient has. These are all myths. Uh, for example, we've done a fairly informal survey of people in Wisconsin with significant, persistent, disabling mental illness. And we found that, indeed, a third would like to quit. 83% have tried to quit. So they're trying to quit whether they get our help or not. And, indeed, almost half said uh, that now's a good time to quit. This is a, a reporting of our last 1,500 smokers that we've enrolled in clinical trials here at the UW. Uh, and we found that 75% of those who are responding to our ads would like to quit have had uh, mood or anxiety or substance use disorder sometime in their life and a quarter in the past year. Keep in mind that since these are often medication trials, we typically exclude smokers who are on MAO inhibitors, bupropion, lithium, antipsychotics, have a history of psychosis, bipolar, eating disorders, or are very, very heavy drinkers. So we've eliminated people with severe mental illness, and we still attract people uh, that have uh, a mental illness. They do want to quit. My smokers can't quit. In our survey, we found about 23% uh, of people with severe mental illness had already quit. That compares to about the same number on uh, the National uh, Behavioral Risk Factor survey, uh, Surveillance System 
uh, median state results. And we also know from our survey that 63% have no consumers like themselves who have quit. Will smoking harm my patient? It's just the opposite. Smoking will hurt, uh, uh, help your patient. A meta-analysis of 19 studies found that if you treat tobacco at the same time you treat other addictions, you get a 25% greater likelihood of long-term absence from the alcohol and the illicit drugs. So it makes good clinical sense. And this has motivated, uh, prompted some providers to suggest not providing tobacco treatment along with another addiction would be malpractice. Another example, uh, it suggested, then, well, let's do tobacco after alcohol. If you do alcohol and tobacco at the same time, you get no uh, impact on the alcohol absence rates. You do get a better tobacco absence rate if you treat them at the same time. And then just recently out, uh, earlier this year, uh, a meta-analysis found that compared to those that did not quit, those that did experienced significant improvements in depression and anxiety and significant reduction in stress. And indeed, the amount of reduction in, in anxiety and depression uh, equaled or exceeded that you would have expected from a medication to treat anxiety or depression. So quitting is good for mental health. Now, that's not to say quitting uh, it, it doesn't lead to more stress in the short run, uh, in the withdrawal and anxiety, but six months to a year later, your patients will be doing better with their mental illness uh, if they quit. The results of these behaviors, uh, these myths, are, are not good. Uh, again, the first A is, will you ask? Historically, psychiatrists haven't asked, psychologists haven't asked, inpatient psych programs have not asked for the tobacco use of their patients. Um, and one effect of this has been, we asked in our survey two questions, does your provider want you to quit the light blue bars? And fully half our response said, yes, my provider wants me to quit. Then we asked them, does your provider believe you can quit? And you'll see what happens. Uh, the 50% drops down to half, a quarter, with the majority going to, I don't know if my provider has confidence in me, or just maybe. So uh, even when providers are asking and are communicating that I want you to quit, we're apparently doing it in such a way that our patients are picking up that we really don't have confidence that they can quit, and that's a problem. Um, this is an interesting letter. It's an old letter from 1980 from a psychiatrist in New York uh, on behalf of a, a long-term psychiatric inpatient program asking for tobacco cigarettes to be donated by tobacco companies because of budget cuts. Uh, he says, in fact, that many of his patients have become strongly addicted because they provide tobacco to them, and in fact, they look upon smoking as their greatest and often their only pleasure, and I submit that's very sad. Uh, in case you think, well, that's 1980, we've come a long way, here's a web posting from 2012. I had a call from a father of a young man who was enrolled in a residential drug abuse treatment program. During his visits, the father noticed that the program gave a carton of cigarettes to residents every two weeks as we were for progress. And indeed, 22% of mental health consumers reported that they started smoking in a psychiatric setting. This has prompted some of my peers to say that our treatment programs themselves became addicted to tobacco. That is, the staff took their break when they permitted all the patients to have their tobacco break. Interesting effect of this is, as, as we know from what we've seen in our survey, 58% of our consumers were current smokers, but about the same number were ex-smokers, so they do quit. That leaves the remaining bar to make up the difference, and it's just the opposite trend there. Clearly, in the general population, there are now far more never-smokers than anybody else. Interesting, among a population of consumers with significant mental illness, there's only 18% of our survey response were never smokers. That is, somehow they never got out of adolescence uh, without being uh, taught to smoke. I have here one last video that you can download. It's simply, a, uh, I think, a five-minute video of uh, people with mental illness talking about their need to quit and how they've been helped or not been helped, in some cases, by the mental health uh, profession. Three things to do. First, to introspect to make sure you don't have any biases. Second, uh, having eliminated those, provide treatment as soon as practical. 
and have a sense of urgency. This is an important uh, health uh, uh, challenge for your patients, uh, and it will kill them half the time. So the guideline recommendation, to be very, very brief, uh, recommends the same uh, types of, of uh, interventions that we've talked about, uh, medications, the counseling, the quit line, et cetera, uh, for all kinds of populations, including this population. Uh, and then, particularly for this population, I would focus on support. Uh, they, uh, for example, smoking is more normative. That means they have fewer non-smoking friends to support them. They have more smoking friends uh, than otherwise, uh, and so they need additional support. Uh, quit lines work, but quit lines, for example, uh, can be difficult for some of the thought disorder to get through the initial call. So consider making that call a joint call to get them started and in general looking for more ways to support those with mental illness. And the last thing I'll just mention, uh, one does have to monitor medications. There are some of the antipsychotic medications, but not all. Uh, the, uh, their metabolism is greatly affected by smoking, not by nicotine, but by smoking itself, such that uh, the liver uh, uh, takes the medications out of the blood uh, quicker, and so that we know that people with mental illness who smoke uh, need more medication to manage their side effects or manage their symptoms. Uh, and so if you remove the smoking and they quit, uh, in the long run, uh, you monitor it because you'll be able to reduce the medications, which is a wonderful thing. But in the short run, you, there is a risk uh, that a, a certain level of medication, uh, uh, which kept the symptoms at bay but didn't have any side effects, all of a sudden develop some side effects, and that's because there's more medication in the blood system because the person's not smoking anymore. So for uh, more information, uh, please feel free to email me if we don't get to questions today. Uh, there's also our website, and you'll find on our website uh, all kinds of uh, information that you, it's in the public domain, free to to uh, download research uh, materials that will use the smokers, uh, et cetera. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Tracy, and I think we have some time for questions. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you so much for that terrific presentation. I, you know, I've uh, been, been doing this a while in, in, in the area of screening brief intervention, and I've just, you know, every time I, uh, every time we have a webinar and we're on a specific topic, I just learn and more, more and more. So I know folks out there sharing uh, probably the same sentiment. Just really appreciate you pulling all of that information together. Uh, some of the questions that are coming in, I just want to sort of pause to let folks, just to remind folks how to uh, get their questions presented and answered. Over on the right-hand side of your screen, you have a, a uh, pain, and one of the areas of that pain is called a questions pain. And you can simply type in your question there, and I will go through and try to identify as many as we can uh, answer over the next. Uh, 10 minutes or so. So, and if you have any technical questions, Missy's still on the line and behind the scenes, and she'll be able to help you some of the technical questions. We'll be focusing really on uh, the more substantive uh, questions. So let's uh, see what we have coming in so far. Well, from your earlier, uh, from earlier in the presentation, you were talking about the meta-analytic studies being studies of studies, and one of the columns talked about the study arms. Could could you clarify uh, when you say a study arm? What is a study arm? Yes, uh, good question. Thank you. Um, uh, a study arm would be a, a more typically understood as a, a treatment condition. So, for example, if I'm going to have a study where I had uh, 50 patients taking the patch and 50 patients on the placebo, that study has two arms or two different conditions. So what we do when we do meta-analysis, we'll take all the arms that are reasonably the same and put them in one big group. So all the placebo groups versus all the patch groups versus all the quit line groups, for example. All those arms get together, so then when we report on a table, we simply want to note how many study arms were included in each of those conditions, each of those mega conditions. 
Great, thank you. Because I remember seeing there were like 11 in one and 55 in the other, and it's simply the num the number of of across the different studies that is what equals the, that 55 number for the number of arms for that particular group. Did I get that right? Yeah, and it, yes, and indeed, in some studies, uh, small study, what you would think would have two arms, a placebo and a medication, but we certainly have studies that have six or seven arms, depending on what they're manipulating and testing. So you may well have 10 studies in a meta-analysis that together contribute 25 or 30 different arms. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like that, that helped clarify. Thanks so much. There's some questions about uh, medication and, and side effects of medication. And there's some uh, practitioners that hear uh, people saying that uh, there's sort of a crazy effect um, around Chantix. Or you, your thoughts about this, or you know, maybe it gets to what you're, you're saying is you have to really monitor uh, the treatment, the medication that the person is on to monitor for side effects to see whether it's the best uh, treatment fit for them. But uh, this person wanted to get your comments about that, that crazy feeling around Chantix. Uh, yeah, the, certainly the most common troubling side effect of Chantix is vivid dreams. And uh, again, not common as in the majority of patients, but common enough that you'd be looking for it. Uh, and, and I don't want to minimize by simply, well, vivid dream. Uh, these dreams are of the you know, surrealistic sort that are so vivid that a person has no knowledge that they're dreaming. And, and they are, can be very upsetting. Uh, that's the most common side effect. I know uh, uh, several years ago, uh, there was reports in the media of um, you know behavioral disinhibition, uh, people losing their temper, uh, also uh, suicidal ideation, um, and uh, though there are reports, the large mega studies didn't document those any more often than placebos, and indeed are no more often than Zyban would have as well. Uh, that doesn't mean they never exist, but it's not a, a, a large risk. But again, there's prudent to be monitoring. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question we have is, do you have any suggestions for adapting the interventions that, that you presented for use with adolescents? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, uh, the literature uh, on adolescents is not encouraging. Um, I, I will say the guideline uh, noted adolescence is one area where medication is not recommended. Uh, but I want to quickly point out that the that was not because um, medications are dangerous or medications don't work. It's simply there's not enough research to assess it. And the guideline would not go forward with recommendation unless there was positive evidence that it worked. So it's kind of unknown. Uh, and, and frankly, the, the, the challenge of adolescence uh, really uh, is complicated by the fact that, you know, in, a, in my approach, you might want to focus on the long-term consequences. But, you know, as you know, adolescents have this psyche that, you know, they're going to live forever and, and, and none of the bad consequences will ever uh, come to their doorstep. Uh, that makes it challenging. I know I'm not answering the question. I'm only adding to why it's a challenge. Um, uh, having said all that, I don't know of any particular tailoring that I'd recommend uh, other than recognizing that if you ask an adolescent if they want to quit, you're going to be very much more likely in the realm of no and doing more patient interviewing uh, than otherwise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that uh, I, I heard at a talk not long ago was that uh, they're trying to tie in things that matter to adolescents. Like you just mentioned, the long-term effects aren't something that's really they're thinking about that's really far off. It's not really affecting them immediately. And I heard uh, someone say that you know what they're trying to do is talk about, well, what affects them immediately, like um, their skin uh, causing uh, breakouts or causing wrinkles. I mean, there were some things across the sort of the vanity 
spectrum that they're trying. And I, I think, you know, there not, might not be enough evidence yet to say those things really work. You know, there hasn't been enough time trying them and to get the trials done. But have you seen that incorporated at, with adolescents? Uh, absolutely. And, 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 and in fact, you know, the current media campaign uh, 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 focuses on, on some of them on this adolescent notion that they don't like to be controlled. That's an adolescent issue of, of being their own person. And so there's a whole series of ads, you've probably seen them, where they point out that, you know, once you're addicted, your friend the cigarette's controlling you. It's dragging you outside, it's robbing your wallet, and you can't do anything about it. And that uh, is thought to resonate particularly well. Again, that harkens back to the prevention side. One of the really great effective campaigns was a truth campaign, uh, really for adolescents in Florida, which is, you know, adolescents don't like to be lied to. And so the whole campaign was built around the deceit of the big tobacco. Uh, mm -hmm. And that responded well. So in general, when you think of a, a particular population, you might want to think about what's relatively unique about that population. I'll give you two quick examples. Working with the poor, uh, we all in healthcare will emphasize the health effects, but when I work with social service agencies, they emphasize the cost savings for the poor uh, because that goes a long way besides just the health consequences. Another quick example for Native Americans, you can uh, tap into the tailor it to the um, historical relationship between uh, in the Native Americans, American Indians, and uh, the Western Europeans to say, you know, they've taken your sacred plant, which you have historically used to bring your prayers to uh, the fathers up, up uh, and they've wrapped it in, of all things, white paper and gave it back to you to kill. Uh, and therefore, you can kind of tap into this cross-generational uh, uh, feelings about, about that power struggle. Uh, that can be effective. So in general, you think about youth, pregnant women, uh, uh, poor, uh, think about what are unique qualities of that population that I can somehow tap into and use that to do my tailoring. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Thank you. The next question we have is, what is the recommendation around interventions for e-cigarettes in healthcare settings? I was hoping I wouldn't get that question. <laughs> um, uh, um, to know, but take a shot at it. <laughs> I, oh, I certainly will answer it. Um, um, I'm just trying to be thoughtful. Uh, well, I, I first would I, I would say that anybody in the tobacco field understands that e-cigarettes are a game changer. What we don't know yet is what direction that game will change. Uh, and, and it's an exciting time to be in tobacco control because you see various uh, gurus lining up on one side or the other. Um, I'm reminded of the New Orleans politician during Prohibition when asked what he thought about drinking and because he didn't want to displease anybody, he said, well, if by drinking you mean that little bit of drinking in the day to relax you and to bring social situations uh, more fabric to them, I'm all in favor of it. But if you mean by drinking that horrible devil's brew that breaks up families and causes a man to lose all, all logic, I'm all against it. If by e-cigarettes it turns out that this is a great harm reduction, we're all for it. Uh, if e-cigarettes turn out to be not so effective to help people quit, not a harm reduction, and indeed renormalize uh, becoming addicted to nicotine to our youth, I'm probably all against it. Uh, having said that, the best advice in the clinical setting is twofold. Uh, we don't recommend it because there's no evidence that it is a cessation tool. Uh, but uh, more helpful is that what we would recommend when people say, well, I'm thinking of quitting, I'm thinking of using the e-cigarette, what do you think about that, doctor? Uh, I would draw upon our, our existing advice is what do you do when somebody says to you they want to try a quit attempt using a method that's not yet proven? or indeed proven not to be useful, like acupuncture hypnosis, for example. Uh, the advice we say is never to denigrate uh, an attempt unless it's a harmful attempt, uh, and to support that attempt, because it may work. And particularly if a person has a belief and an expectation that it's going to be useful, I would support that attempt. I would also, however, say, I think that's great, 
I, I, we don't know that it's, uh, I have to advise you, we don't know that it's effective. Uh, we also don't know if it's completely safe. We just don't know one way or the other. But I'll support your attempt with one caveat. If this doesn't work, would you agree to come back and we'll, we'll try some other things. There are lots of things we can do that are proven to be effective. And so I would build the common ground to say, let, you know, if this works and you quit using it, then we're all very happy. If not, let's try something else and I'll try different medicines. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it looks like we're time. it's time for us to wrap up and there are some really interesting questions I see here. And, you know, if there's any way that our team might be able to get some of these answered, uh, I, we certainly will try if we can. Um, I know that, uh, Bruce, you're so kind to include your email address, so I would say to folks if we haven't gotten to your question, uh, certainly it sounds like uh, Bruce has wel uh, welcomed the opportunity to answer some of them for you. I think some of them are important around how does um, over-the-counter NRT products get paid for, how do um, health center campuses go to a smoke-free campus. There are a lot of, you know, looking for recommendations. I think there's some barriers and challenges out there that people really could look for, uh, get your guidance on. So I would encourage people to uh, contact Bruce. We'll also see what we can do to try to get some of the questions answered and perhaps posted uh, back to the website um, so you could refer back uh, later. It would at least take us a few days to try to get some of those answered, though. So in our last few minutes together, I just want to remind you that the PowerPoint slides, which include links to the videos that sound like going to be very useful uh, for many people. I thank you for sharing those links. Uh, we will The PowerPoints are already posted. Folks can go ahead and access those links even now to take a look at the videos. Uh, you're going to also have the opportunity to receive CE credit for this and uh, for this webinar today. And in, in ex exchange for doing that, we'll ask you to complete the CE quiz uh, that would be required. Uh, we have the recording will be posted within, uh, hopefully within 24 hours, all goes well uh, with getting that uh, rendered up to the website. And uh, to remind you that we these are free CEs and going forward we have uh, upcoming webinars as you can see our list there that are offer free CEs. You're also going to, um, we're going to ask you in exchange for, for uh, offering you this uh, terrific education and these CEs, what we'd really like you to complete a very, very brief short survey. Misty has posted a link to it already in the chat box. It's a SurveyMonkey link. It's an evaluation form. Our evaluations are critical to maintaining uh, our funding and providing uh, this kind of uh, quality education to you. So I can't stress how important the follow-up survey is to us. So thank you very much in advance for doing that. You're going to receive a follow-up email that will include uh, a summary of the information we've talked about in terms of uh, accessing the survey. You can go to the website. Um, it'll give you a link to the website where you can access the, the CE information and, and so forth. And uh, again, there's the website. There's where you'll be able to access all the information for today at the hospitalexpert.webs.com uh, website and how to register for upcoming webinars as well as access the archived webinars, including the one today. And I want to thank you very much for attending and thank you to our sponsors who have made uh, this uh, possible to have Bruce with us today. And we uh, hope that you will join us in the future, in our future webinars, and take advantage of the wonderful opportunities and CEs that we're able to offer you um, through uh, August of this year.